the volume of water that is contained into it for obvious reasons because you need a longer residence time in the tank in order to allow the sand to sink and to settle down on the bottom of the trap. So the gravel trap usually has a lower extension. What happens in practice is that for the gravel trap usually there is an empirical design. Why? For the sand trap there is a more accurate design because, uh, as I said, it's easier to allow the gravel to settle down. And the gravel trap usually is designed... Uh, one could adopt the same procedure to design the gravel trap that I will explain to you for the sand trap. But usually the design is uh, empirical, meaning that people usually design the sand trap and the gravel trap has uh, a volume that is about uh, a volume of water containing in it, which is about half uh, two thirds of the volume of water of the sand trap. And this is why here I design I in my sketch they have more or less the same extension, but usually the gravel trap is shorter. So your diverted water gets into the gravel trap and then you put a kind of a step in the bottom of your gravel trap to divide, to separate the gravel trap from the sand trap. The role of the step is of course to stop the gravel against it. And the step is, you know, the water depth into these traps is varying between 50 centimeters and one meter. The step is placed in a position that allows, that is always submerged at an elevation that such that the step is always submerged. So, if the water depth is 50 centimeters in the gravel trap, then you put a step that is about 35, 40 centimeters in order to build a storage upstream that keeps the, the gravel there. And uh, you need uh, to put uh, a bottom discharge close to the step, which is uh, depicted there. It's here, protected by a gate. And why do you put a bottom discharge there? Because you want to allow flushing. Once in a while, you flush you open the bottom discharge and you originate a flushing of water that brings back the gravel into the river. It's for cleaning. And uh, if it doesn't go into the river spontaneously, you may need to send somebody there that uh, uh, puts the gravel again into the river. And this is the step. After the step, you get into the sand trap. The water depth is more or less the same, 50 centimeters, one meter. You don't want much water into these traps because uh, if you think uh, at a particle that is settling, oops, let me keep it. So if we look at a cross section, it may be done like this. This is the step. This is the step. This is the sun trap. And this is the gravel trap. Here there is the bottom discharge. So, and here you have your water level. And this is about, as I said, 50, 100 centimeters. And the step is usually 35, 40 centimeters. So, for the sand trap, I want to suggest to you a way to design it. And what we do is uh, to assume, first of all, that the flow is laminar into here, not turbulence. 
And this is also why we want to limit the water depth, uh, because uh, we need to, uh, there is a, low, a lower chance for turbulence if you have a uh, low water depth, uh, and also an important requirement, even more important than the water depth indeed, is the velocity. The velocity of the flow inside these traps uh, should be about no more than about 0.5 meters per second. 0.5 is already quite substantial, so it could be between 0.1 and 0.5 meters per second. We will see how to determine this velocity. So we want to avoid turbulence, and in order to design what is the required size for the same trap, we assume that there is a spherical particle of sediment that is uh, close to the surface of water, which uh, tends to sink, of course. But while it's sinking, the spherical particle travels downstream because uh, it is transported by the river flow. So the trajectory is something like this. And therefore, we need to compute the length. I'm not sure what symbol I use there. Let me use L here. The length L that is required at this particle to get to the bottom of the center. And the, the required length is controlled by the velocity of the flow. So let's call it V. And it's controlled by the vertical velocity of sinking, which we call WS. Let's indicate with H this water depth. Now, let's suppose that we can compute the vertical velocity of sinking WS. Then, if we know H, which is the distance that the particle needs to, to run, and we know WS, we can compute the time t that is required to the particle to reach the bottom of the centra. I think I can uh, write up there, I can delete this, I don't need it anymore. So T is equal to L, uh, sorry, H, divided by WS. This is the time required to the particle to reach the bottom. But in, during this time, the particle travels horizontally along a distance L, which is equal to the velocity V of the flow times T. And therefore, L, which is the required length of the centra, is given by the velocity of the flow V times H divided by WS. It's quite simple. The only thing is that we need to know H, okay, we can fix it. Usually we fix it. So we want it about 50 centimeters. So this is fixed by the designer in the interval 50, 100 centimeters. And then we need to determine WS and V to be determined DVD. is uh, B. You know that there is a relationship uh, that in general for a current of flow tells uh, us that the, the discharge or flow 
is given by the product of the transversal area of the current times velocity v of the current itself. So we use this relationship here. And in terms of uh, our, we want to compute the velocity of the flow in the center of V. This is quite simple. We compute V as QB divided B times H, where B is the width of the center. When you compute V, you have to look at the amount of V. We said that V should be 0.1 or 0.5. If the velocity is higher than 0.5, it means that you have to decrease it. How can we decrease it? We, uh, sorry, I, I forgot the V. This is QB. We cannot change QB because it was already determined uh, in the previous design steps, but we can change B and H. So we can increase H, but if we increase H, it's a problem because you see that increasing H basically increases the length of the required, the required length of the center. So if we can increase B, which is the width, it's much better. But sometimes we don't have space, because sometimes when we build these structures, we are in a mountain river where the hill slopes are very steep. So sometimes we can't place a center up that is very wide. So sometimes we have to reduce B. But if we keep B small, then it turns out that the length of the sun trap increases a lot. Okay, that's fine. I mean, sometimes uh, we tolerate sand traps. I have seen sand traps that are 50 meters long. If there is no space, they are very, they are um, reduced in width, but they are extended in length. We still miss uh, WS. Everything is clear so far. I hope so. WS, it is given by the Stokes formula, which I think you have already seen in other courses. And uh, here, if you go down, there is a handwritten, mixed handwritten, and computer written sheet where you see all the steps that are necessary to derive Stokes formula. Let me increase it a little bit in size. The Stokes formula is given by WS is given by 1 over 18, which multiplies the dynamic viscosity of water because if uh, the fluid is more viscous uh, you have of course uh, a slower sinking so if you increase me you see that it is at the denominator so if you increase me you get a decrease of the sinking velocity which is understandable and then here you have uh, the immersed weight of the sediments and usually when we talk about sand, the specific weight of sand, gamma s, is about 2,500 cubic, uh, kilograms per cubic meter, 2,500 kilograms per cubic meter, minus the specific weight of water, which is 1,000 1, kilograms per cubic meter. Of course, uh, the higher the weight of the sediments, the lower the velocity and then you have uh, everything is multiplied by the square of the diameter we assume that particles are spherical so they have they have, uh, the geometry is uniquely identified by 
the diameter d of the particle and usually the diameter is fixed as I said before by the producer of the machinery which is the maximum diameter that the machine can tolerate or it's fixed by law. So d you put here as d the maximum diameter allowed downstream so you are sure that everything that is uh, that is uh, greater than that is taken by the sun trap and then you determine WS. WS, uh, Stokes formula, is determined by imposing the equilibrium between the weight of the particle which is a force that tends to bring the particle to the bottom of the sun trap and uh, the hydrodynamic force, the hydrodynamic force opposes the weight. So basically what happens is that if the particle is uh, in, uh, it's uh, not moving, velocity is zero, you have the weight that prevails of the hydrodynamic force because the hydrodynamic force is proportional to the square of the velocity of the sinking velocity. So the particle starts sinking with increasing velocity until we reach an equilibrium between the weight and the hydrodynamic velocity, which is proportional to the square of Ws, which tends to oppose the weight. And everything is written here. So basically you have the weight P there and the hydrodynamic force F. You equate them and you derive Stokes formula. I'm not going through the each steps, each step of the equation, but please, uh, you should do that because uh, uh, sometimes at the exam I also ask, uh, can you please derive the Stokes formula? It's not a big problem if you cannot derive it, but it's better if you can. Okay, and these are elementary steps. So please, uh, everything is written there. I leave this to you as an homework to go through these steps. So WS is now determined. Good. I should increase the size of this picture. I need to remember it. Uh, because it's uh, handwritten, as I said, so it's a picture. OK, now. Let me see if. Uh, Okay. Here I gave a range for the width in the cell trap that is a bit lower. You see, I said 0 0.1, 0 0.5. Here I'm giving a range up to 0 0.15. So it's a bit less tolerant. And uh, once again, uh, I'm not sure that the symbols are consistent between what I wrote in the blackboard and here, but uh, you can easily translate them. Okay. okay, that's good. And now let's uh, talk about the head tank or upstream tank. If you go back to the sketch that I showed you before, after the sun trap, I put in the sketch a subsequent tank, another tank, which I called upstream tank. It's also called the head tank. What is that? So. Keep in mind that after diverting water, usually water is brought downstream to the user through a pipe, which is called adduction pipe. Let me see if adduction is called, yeah, adduction pipe. So basically you have, uh, after the sand trap, this is the sand trap, there is another step, There is another step whose uh, uh, height is again uh, 40 centimeters, 30 centimeters, and then water gets into this uh, upstream head tank. First, let me 
I remind you that there is, uh, at the end of the sand trap, there is another bottom sluice way, another bottom discharge, another gate, in order to allow cleaning through flushing. And sometimes here, we put a grid in order to remove floating material. It's not always there, but if uh, we suspect that a lot of floating material may flow, then it's uh, advisable that we put this grid there. And then there is the head tank. What is the function of the head tank? The function is that uh, if you have a pipe flowing downstream, which is the adduction pipe, you must be sure that uh, the entrance of the pipe is always covered by a sufficient amount of water. So you need to put the, the pipe at an elevation, a proper elevation, in order to be that sure that the, the upper part, the ceiling, we say in Italian, il tetto, we say the ceiling of the pipe is always covered by water. Why is that? Because you don't want hair into the pipe. Because uh, hair and water together form a mix that is extremely dangerous in terms of damages to the pipe. If you have calves in the pipe and you have hair, bubbles of air into it, when you get uh, water gets against the walls of the pipe, with bubbles, uh, uh, there are repeated shocks that are originated by water mixed with hair against the walls of the pipe, especially if there are calves. So you don't absolutely don't want water there. And uh, for the same reason, you don't want water into turbines or pumps, uh, because then you originate what is called cavitation, which is extremely damaging. It's not dangerous in terms of risk of, for people. It's dangerous in terms of risk of damage for the machinery. So you absolutely don't want hair into it. So this is why you put a tank here, because you need to be allowed to put the entrance of the pipe at a conveniently lower level with respect to the level of surface water. Also, the tank is useful because it can, it can trap sediments that may overpass the gravel trap and the sand trap. But the main reason why we put a net tank here is to make sure that we don't have any air into the adduction pipe. And there is an empirical relationship for preliminary design to determine the delta H star. And uh, if you indicate with uh, V star the maximum velocity that you have in the adduction pipe, the empirical relationship says that delta H star must be greater or equal than 1.5 W star squared divided by 2G which is the kinematic component of the energy of the flow. This is the kinematic component of the energy of the flow. Kinematic component. OK. Even if you bring uh, water downstream through an open flow channel, which is easier to deal with with respect to a pipe, even in this case, it is advisable to put a lead tank 
at the start of the channel in order to drop sediments. Okay. Let me see what else we need. There is a, something here, um, there is a paragraph, a section, which is titled Design of Side Structures. And side structures meaning, uh, I mean structures that are part of uh, the infrastructure of the barrage, but are not directly interacting with the flows. And uh, in particular, I considered, uh, or um, it's not a correct definition, because the first side structure, let, let's say, that I'm considering is interacting with the main spillway. So it's partially interacting with the flow, not always, but uh, during floods, yes. And uh, let me go back to, or maybe I can show you here. Yeah. So, yeah, here you see a sketch of all the side structures. And the, the first thing to say is related to the main spillway. What is the optimal geometry for the main spillway? It can be a vertical wall. If you place a vertical wall there, it's fine for uh, small structures. It's fine where, when uh, you don't see the occurrence of uh, very high flood flows. If you put a vertical wall, what happens is that your, during floods, your flow of water gets this configuration. So basically, you have the main current of flow that passes over this main spillway, of course, and then the flow gets detached from the structure. So here you have a space, a volume, that is not filled by water. There is air there. Because again, the flows get detached from the vertical wall of the main spillway. This happens if you don't, if you put a vertical wall there, instead of putting a geometry that allows a gradual bypass of water. So what happens if you get this void space here, this void volume? What happens is that there is some, uh, as time passes, uh, air is taken away from this volume by water because there is some friction between water and air such that some air is incorporated into the flow of water and therefore air is progressively taken from this volume so indeed this volume becomes completely void nothing is there no water no air and therefore the pressure inside here goes down and gets lower than the atmospheric pressure. So you get into a situation where you have the atmospheric pressure over the water flow, which is not balanced by an equivalent atmospheric pressure below the flow. And therefore, after a while, you run the risk of getting the flow very rapidly taken against the wall. It's what we call in Italian sbattimento, which I cannot translate. In Italian, indeed, we have several meanings for sbattimento, but it's uh, the, more or less uh, the, uh, the effect is the same. It means that uh, it's uh, a repeated uh, stress for the wall. We also use sbattimento to mean a repeated stress for a person. But uh, it's uh, repeated stress. I think it's uh, a very good uh, way of conveying what happens here. And therefore, there is this repeated stress against the wall, which may uh, damage the wall and uh, also create uh, induced failure of the wall itself. 
And therefore, when we, when we suspect that this, this uh, situation may occur frequently, what is the solution? The solution is uh, to fill this volume with by extending the wall. And therefore, put concrete or uh, boulders here, therefore obtaining a profile like this. And there, is, there are analytical relationships suggested for giving the optimal geometry of the downstream wall of the spillway. And uh, these optimal geometries, uh, there are two profiles which can be joined and merged together. One is called uh, Krieger profile, and uh, it was uh, proposed uh, more or less at the same time a very similar relationship by an Italian who was called Shinemi. It was uh, an hydraulic engineer. He was an hydraulic engineer. And therefore, now we are adopting a mixed formulation, which I, is, is not given in my in my notes here, but you can find it very easily on the web. And I'm not providing it here because it's very complicated to remember. It's an empirical relationship. And therefore, it's not needed that you learn it by memory. This profile, which of course is more expensive, is to be used when you suspect that you may have a damage to the vertical wall given by the stress originated by the current. And this is the first side structure. Second side structure is this one here, which uh, is uh, a vertical wall, which we use uh, in order to reinforce the structure. Because when we suspect that uh, the barrage may slip downstream, because you know when you accumulate water and sediments upstream, you get forces acting into the structure. And therefore, you may suspect that it slips down. And therefore, you build uh, this wall here in order to reinforce it. But uh, the vertical wall is also used in order to avoid the piping under the infrastructure. What is piping? Piping is infiltration of water from upstream. If water infiltrates, the water may travel below the structure and then get out downstream. If you get this water flow, which is called piping, under the structure, it is extremely dangerous because this water flow then becomes, uh, increases and increases again, and at the end of the story, it brings the structure, it flushes the structure downstream, and therefore the structure fails. And in order to avoid this flux of water, which is called again piping, you need to make the path of water longer <coughs> under the structure. And one way is to build these walls. And there is an empirical rule that is used to estimate the optimal length which is needed in order to avoid piping, the optimal length of the path, underground path that the water is required to follow in order to originate piping. And of course, if you increase the extension of this wall, you increase the length of the path. And we compute the length of the path by subdividing in vertical part of the path and the horizontal part. So you see length vertical 1, length horizontal 1, length horizontal 2, and then length horizontal 3. And also you have uh, vertical components here, and here, and here. And, uh, and then there is an empirical rule. Let me see if it is uh, yeah, it's here. Which is the Brick Lane formula, which probably you studied also in geotechnics. Uh, and uh, there is a coefficient f that is computed by dividing h, which is uh, the elevation difference between the water surfaces uh, upstream and downstream. So you have water upstream, the, the barrage. Water downstream, you compute the difference between these two water elevations, and you get h. And then you divide h by the sum of uh, the vertical components of the path plus one-third of the horizontal components. 
And f, of course, you want f to be small. And there are values, limiting values proposed by the literature. You can find them very easily if you Google Blig Lane formula. And these limiting values depend on the size of the river, of the material that constitutes the riverbed. And I would say that that's it for barrages. Yeah. The only thing that I would like to say is that downstream, you may have erosion here, especially if the flood flows, again, are very relevant. In order to limit erosion, you can put boulders downstream. This is the solution that is most frequently applied, meaning boulders of uh, big size in order to prevent erosion. Or you may build, like here, a dissipative basin so you create a basin downstream when, where water flows into, and then there is dissipation of energy. The, basins, the basin cannot be eroded, and, and therefore you protect the riverbed in this way. Of course, if you work with boulders, it's more, it's a nature-based solution. If you build a basin, it's less nature-based. OK, so for the parages, we are done. And the next hour, we will introduce, uh, for your joy, probability theory. But I will make it very easy. Because uh, at this stage, uh, you understood that it's extremely important to be able to compute flood flows. Uh, we already know how to compute low flows. Now we have to concentrate on flood flows, because they are essential for designing these structures.